Now we have the idea of control, and control really requires, understanding control requires a little bit of flexibility and judgment. And what we really want to understand is to what extent does the parent control the subsidiary, and that's, the parent doesn't necessarily just have direct control. Direct control would be when the parent just owns a majority of the subsidiary stock. But you could also have indirect control where the parent owns other companies that own the stock. And then things get a little bit crazy. So here's direct control. In one, the parent owns X, so 80%. That's obviously control. In two, they own 90% of X, 70% of Y. That's great. In three, they own 90% X and 80% of Y. And the reality, again, is, is that you, you could have 50, 100 subsidiaries. There could be a lot of subsidiaries here. And what usually happens is they tend to pyramid. And you could have, in a medium-sized company, you could have four or five different levels in this pyramid. Now, what could happen here is, let's say you have indirect control. The parent owns 80% of X, and then X owns 60% of Z. So when you think about it, parent really owns 48% of Z, right? 8.8 .8 times 0.6, and then is it, there's a real question there. How about this? The parent owns 90% of X and 70% of Y, and X owns 40% of Z, and Y owns 30% of Z. So between them, X and Y own 70% of Z, and they're both controlled by P. So P indirectly controls Z. And then you could have even more, one more label here, where P owns X, which owns W, which owns Z, and also P, P owns Y, which owns a small, small piece of Z. And if you add up all these shares of Z, then it's clear that W, X, and Y, really P indirectly controls Z. But none of these individual entities directly control them. So here's an example where all of this gets really crazy. Here, X controls 50% of Y and 70% of Z. And then Y owns 20% of K and Z owns 40% of K. So first question is, does X control Y? Yes. Does X control Z? Yes. But does Y control K? No. And does Z control K? No. But what you can say is that X controls K because X controls both Y and Z. And Y and Z together have 60% of K. Therefore, X has indirect control over K and then X must consolidate K. So what we do is we look not only for direct control, but we also look for indirect control. Now you could have situations where the parent has more than 50% of the stock of the subsidiary, but consolidation is still not appropriate. For example, if the subsidiary is in legal reorganization or bankruptcy, then the parent does not have control over the sub because the court does the bankruptcy court, and therefore consolidation would not be appropriate. You could also have situations where the subsidiary is in a foreign country and the government of that country does not allow the parent to recover its profits in cash. Because the parent owns a subsidiary, but it's not allowed to take the cash out of the country. In that case, we can argue that it's not does not have control, the government does, and therefore may not consolidate. Now, what does it mean not consolidate? We know consolidation is you combine it together like one. So then what are you going to do if you don't consolidate? Then there'll be a single line on the balance sheet investment in this company. So these would be two examples where you could have more than 50% of the stock but not be able to consolidate. And therefore, we got to look at the situations individually and think about them. Just the basic idea, does the parent have the ability to control the sub? Another situation that comes up is where the parent's fiscal period is different from the subsidiary. So the parent might have a December 31st year end, but the subsidiary has a November 30th year end. 
one thing which you can do is change the fiscal period of the subsidiary. The other thing that you can do is adjust the data of the subsidiary to reflect the parent's fiscal year. So even though the fiscal year is, ends November 30th, what you would do is remove December from last year and add December of this year and recreate the financial statements as if December 31st was the fiscal period of the subsidiary, then consolidate them. But you're not going to consolidate apples with oranges. Now, ASC 1055 was issued to try to eliminate a lot of the inconsistencies in consolidation and determining when there's control. And the truth is, is that this is not really complete. This is an unfinished project of the FASB and the FASB is always trying to accomplish this. They've been doing this ever since I've been teaching this class, which is longer than I care to. It's actually, it's not long enough because I, I could keep teaching. I want to teach this class for the rest of my life and I plan on living a long time. So decades from now, students will still be taking advanced accounting with Holtzman. Maybe the videos will be new. I'll have new kinds of videos, but I want to teach this class for a long time. I just wonder like when I'm a hundred years old and I'm still teaching this class, Will FASB have ever come out with a rule on this that really covers everything? So there are real questions about who, when, when the parent has control and what the reporting entity is. And the FASB has moved towards the idea of effective control. And this would be the idea that the parent has the ability to direct the policies of the sub regardless of whether or not it has more than 50% of the stock. And what I happen to think is going to happen, we're going to talk about variable interest entities and special purpose entities later on, is I think eventually the FASB is going to adopt a system that's more like the variable interest entities, where you're talking not only here about effective control, but you're talking about risk. And I think that that's eventually where the FASB is going to go. Um, I don't know, you know, I want to live a long time, but I don't know if I'm going to live that long. But I think that's eventually what the FASB is going to do. In other words, so this could be done very simply by looking at the governance structure of the subsidiary. Is that if there's a board of directors of the sub, how many people does the parent appoint to that board? And part of this problem is also defining the accounting entity. And the thing is, is that the FASB is not clear about what belongs to to the accounting entity and what doesn't. In other words, what's part of the company and what's not. And you're going to see this problem in the coming learning objectives in this chapter. So ASC 810 is a quick attempt to try to address a lot of the issues that come up, but the FASB hasn't yet come up with a comprehensive way of dealing with this. P owns 60% of X, 75% of Y, X and Y jointly own 100% of Z. Under what circumstance would P not be deemed to control Z? A, Z is a bank. B, Z's products are largely sold overseas. C, Z is currently in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. D, Z has a CAO, CEO known to have a bad temper and a serious gambling habit, so we can have no control over whatever that CEO does. E, none of the above. And the answer is... Um, not B. <laughs> the answer is, it's Z is in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. That is the answer. Sometimes you look at these PowerPoint slides and they don't get everything right. I guess whoever, whoever wrote the PowerPoint slide, slides got an A- in this class. <laughs> 